if you'd rather have the more animated talk, uh, switch your video with the shared slide. You sh should be able to read them. I, I use big PowerPoints, but if not, you can just see the, my talking head uh, in the window. So <clears throat> shift testing left to building quality. First, what are the tests for this session? Well, they're also known as objectives. First, describe how shift left testing helps build in quality. Identify the loopbacks that get reduced by shift left testing. Identify some different aspects of shift left testing. And describe the collaboration involved. So, do you have any tests? You can put them in the chat and then we'll uh, check at the end to see if we passed your test, which I won't even know about which is really shift right testing, but put some tests in, your, in the chat and we'll see whether we covered them or not. So I'm Ken Pugh, I'm a chief consultant. I don't know why my uh, image decided not to pop up there. Uh, I've got a couple of books out, Lean Agile Acceptance Test Driven Development, Better Software Through Collaboration, Free Factory, which is about extreme abstraction, extreme separation, and extreme readability of code. And I'm the co-creator of the Safe Agile Software Engineering course. So here's my one overall rule. There are exceptions to every statement except this one. And what do I mean by that? When I say you always ought to do something, I don't mean always, always, but usually always. And when I say you never ought to do something, I don't mean never, ever, but usually never. So if there's something I say in this talk and you go, that's not gonna work here, feel free to raise your hand with the exception because we learn by the exception as well as by the rules. So here's my second overall rule. Context is everything. Everything exists in a context and everything is always true in some context. Ah, you read about Netflix. 15,000 deployments a day. But with Netflix, what's the worst that can happen? Somebody's looking at a video, the new, uh, the new version has just been deployed. You have a video issue. Person just reclicks and says, oh, my internet provider must be screwy. There you go. That's the worst that can happen. Financial institution, you're selling stocks. That stock trade doesn't go through. You've got a disappointed consumer and maybe the SEC on your backs. So everything is always true in some context. And we need to understand the context to really understand what uh, we're really talking about. Lastly, perspective. Ah. For some reason, my image has just decided to disappear. So let me just describe this. Three perspectives on everything, as we'll see with the triad or anything else. Three ways to look at something. And when you look at it from three different views, you get to a better truth than you can by just looking at it in one way. Oh, here's an introduction. What is built-in quality? Well, I consider it to be two parts. One, building the right thing. And second, building that thing right. Two halves to the issue of quality. So now, the next question is, why do I want to invest in shifting left your testing? There's a curve, and even though we're still in the agile world as opposed to waterfall world, these numbers still actually um, are somewhat true. If we take the effort to gather a requirement issue at requirement time, we're going to call that a one. If we don't find out about until coding time, it's a four, because now we have to go back, make sure we understood the requirement, and <clears throat> do a little recoding. Testing is going to be a 16. 16 because now we've got a JIRA card to write up, 
defects to track triage meetings and so on. And finally, if we don't make it into production, that is going to be a 64 because now we have redeployments and everything else to do. Some places, even agile places, have measured what is the relative effort for production, and it's not a 64, but 250. So we go up from one to four to 16 to 64. A lot of effort. That's why we want to move back our testing. If you want, do you know your estimate for how much is the relative effort in your place? Is that a metric you actually keep track of? So now let's just take a look at a typical um, uh, deploy deployment site. We write a feature. Then we write a story. We write some code. And now you go, oh my gosh, we need to do something. So let's test the code. Oh, I guess we ought to test the story then. And finally, yeah, let's test that feature. And what happens is we get something that looks like this, which is our traditional testing. We think about testing after we created the item. And of course, that's called the V model because it looks something like this. So here's our flow. Our flow, we're going to decide we're going to do something. We do some analysis, and this doesn't matter whether it's, it's, um, it's waterfall or even agile, which is just the size of the elements that go through the flow. We analyze for the requirements. We do maybe a few minutes of design some coding, finally we get it done, we test it, deploy it to staging, and finally execute it in production. And we get a flow. But what happens if it were that, were the perfection? We get some blockages from test back to code, defects. Uh, put in your chat box, what percentage of time does something go to test and go back out to, to um, and have to be redone. Is it, if it's 0.01%, you can leave this talk right now. You have no problems. But if it starts to be one, five, and in some places I've seen it, some people have reported as high as 60% of everything that goes to test has to get back to code. That's one blockage. So we have some defects. The second blockage with even more sort of defects is that we realize that the requirements have not been well understood. And so we have some backward loopbacks on that and another blockage. And finally, from production back, we even have potential production defects that now take more time. Everything slows down the flow. So we want to always be thinking about testing. We write a feature. We create a feature test. You can't test something that hasn't been created yet, but you can actually describe a requirement in better detail if we have a test for it, as we'll see. We write a story. We write the story test. We write the code. Well, we write the code test at the same time. And that's, in fact, we'll even see we write the code test before the actual code. And what have we had? We shift our testing left. We are thinking about the testing at the time. We are thinking about the requirements and what we want to do. The question is, is it shift testing left or shift left testing? You pick. In either case, you can't test something until you have that something. So what we are actually doing is about creating the test on the left, not executing the test on the left. Create the test at the time we're creating the feature or the story or the code, and then executing it when that's available. So here's my number one rule. No code goes in until the test goes on. That is, not a single line of implementation until you have a test at some level that says, 
that that implementation is working right. If you follow that one rule, you will have testable. So here's our flow now with test. Well, we've got three different types of flow. We have hypothesis-driven development, which is for the product management. We've got our HDD, hypothesis-driven development, which starts at the decision and runs to the execution. We've got our behavior test-driven development, which is the triad. And that runs from the analysis to the deploy stage. And finally, TDD, with a loop back at the design and coding stage. We're designing and coding at the same time. So there's our three loop backs. So now, what we want to do is write testable features, story, and code. So we have our feature tests, which are going to tell us whether we are writing the right thing. And we're going to use hypothesis-driven development for that. We'll have our story test. We'll create your behavior-driven development with the triad. And we'll have our code test, which the developers will be writing. So those are our three levels. Let's take a different perspective of this. Here's our as-is system. We have some story tests against it. We have some code tests against it. And if we're doing infrastructure architecture right, we also have some enabler tests against that infrastructure and architecture to make sure that's working. So there's our current state. Now let's go to the 2B. What's the first thing we want? Is a feature test, an hypothesis. Did the feature that we are creating is it actually delivering business value? So we're going to create that. And then we'll have our story test and our code test that are for the implementation. And those are in addition, obviously, to our existing story and code test. So tests and requirements are interrelated. It turns out that every requirement should have a test. Or else, how do you know the requirement is actually working? The implementation is working. And every test is a requirement. If you cannot ship a system with a test that fails, then that test is a requirement. Wouldn't it be nice to have the requirements ahead of time and therefore to have the tests ahead of time? So if you can't deploy with a failing test, that test is a requirement. Therefore, we like to have our requirements before our implementation. So let's start with hypothesis-driven development. We have an idea for a functional change. Hypothesis. Is the customer actually going to use that functional change? And that hypothesis is actually a test that tests whether we're building the right thing, what the customer wants. And it comes from Lean Startup, Lean UX, and lots of other places. So what, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to create the minimum marketable feature, take the feature and take it down to its essence. Smallest piece of functionality that has at least some business value or market value that we can see that people are going to use. Why do we want to do it? Get that functionality out. See if the users are actually going to be using it. And if they aren't, well, then at least we've learned something. So we're going to have a benefit hypothesis that's going to validate is our test for the business path. We have an hypothesis. We build that small little MMM. We test it. We see whether it's working, whether people are actually utilizing it or not. And if they aren't, stop. Think of something else. Yep, it looks like they're doing it. Nothing else to do with it. Let's go to the next MMF. Or uh, if we just make this one little change, let's pivot and we'll try it again. See if something. So 
What we're going to do is learn from the users what they truly desire based on their behavior. They're the only ones who can tell us that. So let's take an idea here. Got a great idea. I'm going to have cruise control with the speed automatically set by the speed limit. Ah, isn't that a wonderful idea? I don't have to look for signs anymore. And we're going to determine that speed limit by a GPS with a map, or maybe we have a sign reader, hmm. or both. Well, it turns out autonomous vehicles are going to be requiring this. Either that or Elon Musk is going to have a lot of traffic tickets to pay off because he's the one who'll decide at the speed of the car. So that's my great idea. That's my MMF. All right. So let's give a little more detail on it. Given a speed limit sign, when the car views it, the speed is set to 35 miles per hour. And there should be a speed limit sign, but for some reason, my PowerPoint decided not to put images up today. So now we come up with our benefit hypothesis with some metrics. And the benefit hypothesis is we think this capability will produce this outcome as measured by this metric. Here's an example. We think that cruise control with the speed limit finder will be used by drivers 90% of the time as we measure it by telemetry we will have had a successful feature. Yeah, right. We don't even have to put this one up. What do you think the results will be? Raise your hand if you're actually going to use this. Let me see if I can see anybody's hands up. Okay, maybe there's about one there. I can't see all the participants at once. So now, let's change our hypothesis. Okay. One. One way to stand. Yeah. Chances are that there will be some people who use it, but not our 90%. So maybe we need to alter and pivot on this hypothesis and give the ability to set the speed X amount over the speed limit. And now the question is, what should that be? Should it be 5 miles per hour? Hmm. 10? 15, 20, okay, how much, good question, well, somebody from Massachusetts, and I happen to have lived there, we go, what, it's got to be at least the minimum of 20, or else the, the cars in Route 128, I'd be, I'd be uh, rammed into, so, we're going to pivot on our hypothesis. And now maybe with this additional thing, we'll, uh, but of course now Elon Musk doesn't have to worry about this because the human will have set the speed limit uh, over it rather than Elon doing it. So now maybe we decide we're just going to display the speed limit and let the individual have their thing. Or just display a warning if it's over the speed limit. We'll alter hypothesis, come up with a percentage of the times that people think we're going to use this. There we go. That's our test at the top for have we got the right requirement, the right feature. So let's take a look at the other two. Behavior-driven development. Tests get created for the functionality prior to the implementation to make sure we're building the thing right. And this is where we have the developer, tester, and customer are our triad. And they're all responsible for the quality of the product. So now, we're always thinking test first. And let me tell you one other little principle. It's easy to automate tests that have been written before an implementation than to try and automate an existing implementation. Turns out most people, if you don't have any tests for an implementation and got a big user interface, the only thing you typically can automate is the user interface, which is the slowest and most fragile place to do that. 
So well, that's why we want to come up with our test first. And these are tests from the business point of view. So here we have a behavior for a scenario, a flow test. Given our setup, here's our current state. When an action or event occurs, then our expected results. So if we're going to turn this into a test, all we do is see what we actually got and compare it to the expected results. If it matches, the test passes. If not, it fails. So this is one way to do our test. So let's look at an example of this. In fact, and we'll talk about the difference between BDD and ATDD. BDD basically focuses on the behavior. So here's a scenario. When given the car's speed limit is 30 miles per hour, when it changes to 20, then the car's speed becomes 20 miles per hour. That's pretty straightforward. That's a scenario. We're going to turn this into a test. Given the speed limit is 30, it changes to 20. We're going to simply check and compare did it actually change to 20. There we go. Scenario and a test. Looks pretty much the same. Which is, in fact, ATDD simply says, I know we're going to be writing a test for it. So we're going to test the desired behavior. BDD says we're going to specify the desired behavior, which we're going to test. Or ATDD says, well, I'm going to test the desired behavior. So BDD and ATDD are actually just slightly different viewpoints on exactly the same. Any other behavior we want to specify? Hmm. Maybe things about how fast it, it speeds up or slows down. Do we want to just put those brakes on as quickly as possible, or do we want to be mileage sensitive and just sort of drift to the 20 miles per hour? So here is a business rule. Oh, look at that. 35 miles per hour, and we are in a school zone. So the speed limit is going to vary in school zones. And now we're going to have some business rule tests, which are simpler than our scenario tests. It simply shows that we understand the business rule. There's our business rule data. We're at 745 to 845. It should be 35 miles per hour. Otherwise, it would be 45. And now we have some tests for the business rule. 7.44 a.m., we're going to be doing 45, because that's the speed limit for the road. 7.45, 35 miles per hour, the school zone applies. Now these tests show that everybody understands the business rule. Now this obviously is a simplistic one, but business rules are probably the place that most defects occur because they can be rather complicated. So now, we've got back, if we looked at it, probably want to have eight examples or tests to make sure that we understood both starting and stopping and so forth. But one of the other reasons we do this is we might question things, getting into details with our subject matter expert, our product owner, our business analyst, whoever knows the details of the requirements. Well, it's 7.44, it's 45. At 7.44, no one second, should it still be 45? When do we actually turn it to 7 at 35? Let's get into the detail. Take care of that deep, that misunderstanding right now. So that's in our BDD, our triad gets together. And finally, the last, I call it test-driven development, test-driven design. With two halves here. Thinking test first. You don't test code, you code to the test. You write a test and you code to the test. Now, this is on a separate level on the developer side. And now, why do I call this test driven design? Because we already have tests from the behavior point of view. And our design takes responsibilities for passing those tests at the external level and assigns them to internal entities. 
components, classes, or anything else. So our internal tests are always in the context of an external test. There's no sense to have a test for something internal if we don't have a test external that relies upon that. Some people always start with, well, let's start to do TDD first. And it's like, no, no, first we do BDD to get our context. And then we do TDD now to figure out what components we want in order to pass those external tests. So here's our cycle, much quicker. We code a test, simple little test. We check the test fails. We write the code to pass the test. We check that other tests pass. We refactor the code if necessary, and we check that all tests pass. A cycle, one simple little test, do something, do something, do something. On the order of? 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes. Let's give an example here. Here's our business rules for the school zone. There was our 744. We went 45 miles per hour, the speed limit for the road. That was one of our tests for the external world. That's our first test that we are going to actually try and pass. We code up just that test. Then we try the next test and make sure that our code works or needs to be altered to make that test pass. And we do it for 845, 846, and for the four other things. We're taking one at a time and making our code work for it. For example, for the speed sign processing. Well, we might break our, our implementation into parts because we don't really understand how to process speed signs perfectly. So let's just have a test that has a sign just right straight on perfect font and everything. Then we get a sign that has some, uh, a side on, clean text, but we're looking at it at a diagonal. Make sure our thing all works for that. Then we can put some fuzzy text on. Or maybe we have a head on with missing letters or bullet holes or whatever else we, like we have on some of our back roads in North Carolina. There we go. One simple test, we're not trying to do the entire feature at once. We're taking one smallest aspect of something and coding to that aspect. So this is not an ending, but a beginning. Here's what we showed before. We have our existing story tests from the outside world, our code tests from the inside world, and of course our enabler test. When we create a feature, let's create a hypothesis that says we are creating that feature right and a way to monitor whether it's actually been used. Our code tests and our story tests that are going to be written for the new feature. We wrote the feature test first, then we created our story test, and now we'll be creating the code test to help pass those tests uh, for the outside. So what does this do for our flow? Well, there were our loopbacks on our blockages. What we're going to do is something slightly different. When we decide to do something, we're going to create our hypothesis that is going to check to see whether we're just creating the right thing. When we analyze, we're going to be creating our test. When we design, well, we've got our test at the design time, and we make sure our design is testable. Obviously, when we code, we're going to be coding with the test, and our code is going to pass the test that developers create that help pass the test at the behavior level, at the external behavior level. Ah, oh, test. Do we need that anymore? Well, maybe in some cases you might not, or maybe you still will. It's definitely going to be reduced. Why? because we've taken care of most of the functional defects, and now we might have environmental defects or something like that. And then, of course, we'll deploy with the test, use the test to make sure our staging is working, and finally, we go and put it in production. All of these things, this loop back here, gets minimized, if not reduced entirely. This loop back, it's minimized, if not reduced. 
and probably most of your production defects, at least from misunderstanding a requirement, all goes away. And your flow dramatically increases. So just recap one more. We described how shift left testing helps build in quality, identify how our loopbacks get reduced, identify the different aspects of shift left testing, and then describe the collaboration. Did the session pass your test? Well, uh, we'll check on the uh, chat box and see if you had any tests that you came with. I'll just mention, if you want to experience DDD, ATDD, and TDD, I've got a couple of workshops, Lean Agile Acceptance Test Behavior and Test Behavior Driven Development. We're now all, all remote enabled, five days for three teams, a half day for, uh, per Two, we have two half days for all the teams and one half day where we uh, work with each team. We're going to use the team's real stories for the exercises. And as I mentioned, two half days for all the teams and one half day for each team. And we come up with real behavior-driven tests. And behavior-focused test-driven development and design, which is really just for the developers or developer test or pair. And you can contact me on LinkedIn or email me at tenantenq.com. So, go forth and shift left your test. Thank you. And we'll take some questions. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Yeah, we've got a couple questions in the chat. So, we'll start with those and then open up the floor. Um, so, one comes from Revere who said, um, for traditional testing, what are the key parameters that need to be considered while embarking on shifting left testing? What are the key parameters? Okay. So, um, chance, uh, uh, there's a couple of things. What you, what, what you want to do, hopefully, your, your testers are not in a silo. The first thing that you need to do is get them out of the silo and working with developers. The second thing is if they are just UI testers, that the only thing they can do is just go and test it. They have to see a UI and test. We need a little more training, a little more perspective changing in order to be able to figure out how to test things without a UI, because we're going to be creating our test with, without seeing a UI. Maybe we might have a prototype, maybe not. But what we're really testing is a functionality flow. So that's the second thing. But the, the big thing is, when you first institute this, well, all of a sudden, the testers need to start helping the triad create the test first. And there's going to be, I'll call it a, a little bit of chaos or confusion or delay as you suddenly start switching. Because it, if you're still post-testing the old stuff, well, testers are needed for that. And so... They can't help with the new stuff. So you need to just shift in slowly into this gear. Or just take one, one sprint and say, okay, we are going to do our shift. Take your uh, IMP uh, uh, sprint and, and do that. So. Okay, thanks, Ken. Uh, next question. Um, do we need to stop the flow if we, and this is from Revere as well, do we need to stop the flow if we identify a defect? And if so, how can it be achieved? Do we need this? Well, if you, if you find a defect, okay, so at every stage along here, obviously a developer, if they're, if a test is not passing that they created, why should you go onward? And, but that's going to be a little cycle time in there. If we're taking it at a story level, this is how we describe what the story should work. The developer can, as they are creating the code, are going to be able to test against that story as well. They're testing their individual pieces, and now they have the BDD test that they can test the whole thing. Why should we go onward unless our implementation, if our implementation is not passing? And the only consideration would be if the developer said, look, it's going to take me like, you know, Six months. I've gotten like 90% of the, 
But to get to 99.9 .9 identifying, it's going to be another six months. Can we change that test and alter it, change the scope, and get out stuff that still passes all the tests? So it becomes a scope issue. So the defects, it, the defects shouldn't be pushed onward further in the flow. It would simply be that at, at the appropriate time, you are fixing the defects. And you always have the one exception where maybe a defect is so severe um, because there's issues in implementation that then you need to bring that to a higher higher level. Thanks. Uh, next question comes from Haley Campbell, um, who spent most of her career in resource-strapped organizations. She'd love to hear any suggestions for easy-to-implement resource-light testing strategies. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> easy to implement testing strategies. Um, well, okay, so my first, my first thing is, if you are resource uh, strapped, by doing this, you are actually going to start to free up some resources. Those meetings where you're triaging the defects are going to start to decrease. I never say go away entirely, but they're going to decrease in time. And so that that is going to help start to, to, to unstrap your, your resources. Um, other strategies, um, well, and a lot, in fact, I'll just give you an example in the team that I, I taught, and they sent me back a report a couple of months later. And it turns out that that team, which was strapped for resources, what happened was by doing the shift left, the testing got spread across the entire sprint rather than two hours before the end of the sprint deadline. Well, that made it a lot, a lot easier. Lead developer and the lead tester were much happier, much less stressed. And so by doing this, you spread the testing effort across. The developers start taking on a lot of the testing, the actual execution of the test, because they now have the test. The problem with normal testing is the developers just write code, they don't have a test for it, and they turn it over to the testers. And now that, that transfer and of, of that is what causes the delay. So by putting this in, you actually will decrease the resource of that answered your question. Thanks. Um, so, and there's some good discussion related to this as well in the chat, uh, too. Um, the next question, um, are the wonderful tests, BDD, HDD, HDD, TDD, uh, TDD, what is the order for learning curve? Which one do you recommend learning first for new trainees? You recommend okay. the second for learning, third? Okay. So, the BDD is what I always suggest first. That's where you, that is where your biggest bang for the buck is going to be, is to actually create the details of the requirements through tests with the triad before implementation. you got to test the thing anyway. Well, why not create the test first? And you'll get your, and that is going to eliminate code that has to be rewritten, uh, bug reports that need to be written, and so forth. I'm not saying that you're going to get rid of all of them, but that's your biggest thing bang for the buck. Then, the HDDD is really at the product level, okay, which doesn't involve the developers, although they didn't know about those, the, the thing, but it's really for the, um, for the uh, product management group to, to come in. Uh, I say that uh, depends on what your portfolio and how you handle portfolios. I would consider that sort of like a parallel thing, if you will. Um, and it could be higher or lower than the BDD. I probably, you know, I'm putting it on a parallel track here. And then the last thing is for the TDD and for the doing the design, everything. Some people always start with that. Uh, and I go, well, you can't start with that because what we need to do is make sure we're actually testing the right stuff, which is what we do with the BDD. So doing that 
doing the TDD lab is, is what I, I would say. TDD first, TDD last, and wherever the product management wants to be with the The um, but one thing, and, and let me just uh, uh, mention this, is some people say, okay, so I've got a business rule, like that, that uh, speed limit, uh, school zone speed limit business rule. Looks like I have a BDE test for it, something that's in a, uh, a business file. Do I need to write a unit test for it? No. You don't need to do that. You've written the one level test, even if it's only calling one method in your code that does the computation, you already have a test for it. You don't need to write a unit test. And if, and the, so the reason I, I put the BDD first is, uh, my, my uh, wild estimate is about 50% of the code in this world is all about business rules. And those are the things our BDD tests are going to be testing. Well, if we can do nothing else but make sure all our business rule tests are passing. We got 50% of our code working. Now, we still may have other issues with our underlying infrastructure, but those, in fact, are the simplest tests to actually start to automate. And for the example I always give, the ATM, which is sort of like your typical uh, design problem. You go to an ATM. You put in your card, you ask for $20, you get $20 back. That's an easy test. You put your card in, you ask for $20, and it says, sorry, I'm not going to give you that. Those are, those are two tests. But there are about 132 business rules for the banking industry on how much money you can take out of your ATM. And those are the complex things. Those are the things we need to test. And all that other infrastructure, well, you've got two tests for it. If you've got a lot of code underneath that support getting the money out, yep, you definitely need some internal component work there. But you, the most important thing would be to get your business to success with. Excellent. Thanks, Ken. So our next question comes from Sheila, and she asks, most people seem to associate uh, regression test beds with waterfall. Do you, or do you see some sort of regression as an element of ongoing testing and shift left testing? Um, regression testing, in, in some sense, regression testing is even more important in the natural world. If we were always making changes and tweaking our code a bit, we want to have, in fact, more automated regression tests to make sure that the changes that we are making now did not affect what we did previously. In Waterfall, well, okay, you don't test for six months. All right, might as well just test it all again. You made some major changes. And so having one of uh, that you've got almost an entirely new, probably feature, entirely new thing to, to test if you're doing waterfall. If we're getting something out every two weeks, let's make sure that we haven't broken anything yet. And so that's going to be our regression test. All these tests, of the BDD test or the unit test, should still continue to pass unless you change what the behavior of the system should be. Thanks. Um, so any live questions, um, and feel free to also pop other questions in the chat. Uh, I do have one for you, Ken. So um, I've noticed in organizations that I've worked in that uh, TDD has been um, a very tough uh, and challenging thing to introduce to developers, and I would say maybe just a handful at most I know have practiced it in the past. What is the best way to um, work with teams and especially developers that might not necessarily see the value in this to um, have them uh, see some of the light? Oh, okay. So this is interesting because this is why I push DDD first. Because developers, their number one complaint is they may 
XY button. So if we have those, those behavior tests from the outside world, speed limit and so forth, or anything else that we must have, developers now have detailed requirements to test against. Now the issue comes in is that if we've got our external world requirements, developers should pass them. Okay? We should be able to write code that passes those tests. Where does the TDD come in? Well, how complicated is our implementation inside? Is it five lines of code or five thousand lines of code? If it's five lines of code, you don't need to do anything like TDD. Just write your code and make sure it passes the business rule test. That's pretty straightforward. If it is more complex implementation, well, what if you like to write tests for your individual components? I'm not just talking about at the individual method level. I'm talking about at the interface level, the interface between components. Well, if you like to have a test against that to, to just make sure that it's working the way you think, so you can sort of like put that implementation that interface aside. Oh, and by the way, if you don't like the implementation, well, you can change it and you have the uh, uh, the, uh, the test to make sure that your changes haven't worked, even if, however you're doing them. So, when it, so we have it from the outside. So, so the issue sometimes comes is, oh man, with the TGP, I've got to write the test and I write the test and I write the test and I write Okay. That can be a mindset shift. But if we just look at it as slightly different, that first we have the tests from the outside world, you got to pass those. Is that test-driven development? Well, not not with the little cycle thing. It doesn't, you know, two minutes. Yeah, it might take you weeks to pass that external test. But at least that's already, that is, some people call the BDD test-driven as well. Now the question is, do we want to write tests for each one of our little individual components? Or are we testing a bigger behavior? I'm always, in fact, that when people uh, start to hear about PDA, it's like, yeah, test every little component, every single method. I go, now, test the bigger components and their behavior, and you will ultimately get the, uh, your individual components should be tested as well. Because if you have an individual component that isn't executed through the bigger behavior, why is that component there anyway? So, in short, think of it as a contextual thing. They're always, that's sometimes always introduced at the bottom method layer, which means that every message you write has to be tested. Don't think of it that way. We take it from the outside world, get to a component level, and test that. And the size of the components then are up to the developer. So that's how I introduce it to, to those guys. Excellent. Thank you. So, yeah, we've got just a few minutes left. Uh, we've got about three more questions, so we'll go rapid fire on these. When you, this comes from Zoe. When you come into a team that has been trying to implement these principles and seeing some success, but still a long way away from significant unit testing coverage and automated UI coverage and seeing prolonged release cycles, do you typically recommend continuing to learn and improve as they go, or do you recommend significant chunk of time on refactoring unit tests, increasing automation coverage? Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, quick, since we have three left. Um, if you've already got the, uh, if you've got already the uh, automated test against your UI, probably they're a little bit grainier or coarser than, than fine. Um, what I suggest doing, and it all depends on how your application is designed, is to try and come at a level that is beneath the GUI, yet still as bigger components, i.e. the equivalent of a, a CGI script that might um, be run as part of a, of a web page or something. Let's test those things at that level down, as opposed to the actual GUI itself. And now you're not as I just mentioned the previous, we're not trying to test every individual unit. We're trying to test the behavior of that CGI script. And so bring it up beneath the GUI, but bigger up than the unit level, and that probably would be a, um, it's a sweet spot for where you might introduce more automated testing. 
Excellent. So next question we have is, uh, for those who are new here, can you speak on the difference between unit versus regression tests? <laughs> okay. Um, boy, this is almost uh, a, a, like a thing in itself. I actually tend not to use the term unit test. That is a common term in, uh, uh, in, uh, <laughs> in our, our society. Google has a much better term. They divide things into large, medium, and small tests, i.e., slow, medium, and fast tests, which may be unit tests or anything like that. What we like is as many fast tests as possible. The slow tests are like the end-to-end, -end, always going to do it. So a unit test, which is against the level of code, make sure that code works. And the reason for the regression test is that we're going to not only test it now, but every time we make a change to the code, we're going to go back and run that same test over and over again to make sure that, yeah, we were doing a new requirement, but whatever we did then hasn't messed up our previous. So the regression part is just running all those same tests that we created on the development side and making sure that they still work with, with your altered code. Thanks, Ken. And let's, we'll have this as the final question. I'll copy any of the others, and we can follow up on the Meetup page afterwards. So final question, what is your recommendation for writing tests? And this comes from Leora. What is your recommendation for writing tests ahead of implementation? For a Greenfield project, do you leave the failing tests, or do you write the tests to show that the implementation is not yet done? As an example, a multi-person team building an API from scratch. Some are frustrated at test writing by someone else failing, causing build failures in Maven, but they should be failing because whatever aspect of the API endpoint hasn't been written yet. Gotcha. Okay. So the quick thing on the build. I want, uh, in fact, depending on how you write your test, you should be able to have little tags that say, these things should work and these things shouldn't. And so, as one is developing API, if you have nothing yet, all of our tests are in these, well, these are not break the build tests. These are tests that tell us how things are working. Regression tests are those that we've already tested, it works, and those should break the build because, as we were just mentioning, things change and we messed up something. And now, as you say, we have 20 methods in an API, or 20 um, uh, responsibilities in API. As we implement one of those responsibilities, We'll move it into the break the build. We'll move it in slowly, one at a time, and when we finally get them all out of the break the out of the uh, don't break the build into break the build. Now we know we're done with that API. So yeah, some of these tests it might take a week to pass. Put them in the don't break the build part, but we're now getting the in the uh, amount of tests that are failing shows us the work that we still need. Yep. And we use the failing test to say, as a rough indication of how much done we are with that API. That's an awesome response. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, thanks, Ken. I wanted to uh, you know, just say it was a great presentation. There was a lot of feedback in the chat. Uh, we had one question I didn't get to, but uh, I'll pass that along. And then it got posted on the Meetup page. And then the recording inside deck as well. So um, thanks for your time. One, one final thoughts, Tim? Uh, hope you guys are doing OK and, and awesome. I've read about Texas, so take care of yourself. Yes, we definitely will. Thanks for joining us and uh, appreciate it. And uh, on to the next session. Next session, right. next yeah. month. All right, see you. Bye-bye.